I'm Catherine, and I play a lot of role-playing games. Yep. Give me your dice rolls, stat checks, epic campaigns, fiction-first mechanics, gnarly character creation. I am down for that. I call that a Saturday. Um, so I have found my gaming home in modern tabletop RPG. So as a resident of this weird and wonderful country of play, I'm here to help spread the good word of story gaming to all you folks here uh, and see what hard-won lessons of narrative design we can bridge across formats. Let's start with introductions, as is only proper. I'm 50% of Thorny Games. We're an indie game design studio and publishing company making story-driven tabletop games. Up to this point, our games all revolve around language in some form or another. We find language as a subject matter is a surprisingly effective inroad to emotionally connecting with players. In our designs, we try to explore the deeper side of language and what it means to people, be it through culture, identity, or just how we perceive the world. Thankfully, we've had some successes to date. Uh, the community on Kickstarter has been kind to us, um, and we've seen kindness also in the form of some awards and recognition uh, at places like Indiecade and South by Southwest. All of this is just to say that we think there's something powerful in these topics. It resonates with enough folks for us to continue to do what we do, and we are stoked to forge ahead. So. Um, as someone who is passionate about role-playing, first and foremost, at Thorny Games, we try to make a habit of crossing barriers between different gaming communities and then introduce new players to the excitements of tabletop story gaming. And that is why I am here. You may be totally new to tabletop role-playing games. Great. Let's talk about what they are. Um, you too may be a deep convert and play them to bits. Also great, let's get mutually excited about them together. So tabletop role-playing games are analog games where players focus on telling stories together. So some of these stories are tried and true, like storming a dungeon and looting the treasure, but more and more in the modern scene, they are quite different. You might be telling the story of the downfall of a civilization with some fatal flaw, building the language of a people born in isolation, or find yourself as a World War II era Soviet airwoman fighting Hitler by night and the patriarchy by day. <laughs> right? Yep. There's a lot to unpack here. So, as digital narrative designers, why should we care? If you're looking for inspiration off the beaten path, these games are provocative. They're treading innovative ground in design and telling new stories that many mediums just aren't touching. Games about community, identity, loss, they're truly pushing the boundaries of what modern gaming is exploring. Increasingly, the word is also getting out. These games are getting more and more attention. No longer content to just being on the sidelines doing their own weird thing, people are talking. Um, both for more established games and in the indie setting. So down at IndieCade last year, the jury's prize award winner was a fantastic indie RPG called Bluebeard's Bride. One of the creators is in this very room about, cre about creeping feminine horror. Um, so as indie RPGs are breaking through to mainstream recognition, we now regularly see projects on Kickstarter that are raising in the thousands, if not millions. Um, and so right now, this is a bid for all of us to be on that edge and to learn from the narrative design challenges and insights that these games have had. But before we start talking about the avant-garde of tabletop role-playing, we should establish the mainstream. The most common example of a tabletop RPG is, of course, Dungeons and Dragons. In D&D, players each create and then embody characters on an adventure, usually revolving around overcoming various challenges through combat. As they adventure, they get better at what they do and they increase their various stats, which might make them great at magic or swordsmanship or inspirational singing or something. Um, the narrative itself is a collaboration between players and one very special player called the Game Master, though not in a totally equitable style. Players will control the actions of their characters and roll dice to determine their success, but everything else comes from the Game Master. So determining what the characters encounter, uh, who needs their help, how difficult the challenges they face are, the GM introduces all of these during play by describing what the characters see, what the players see, and sense as they move through the world that's been created. 
So RPGs as a whole are undergoing a huge surge in popularity right now. Uh, the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons really nailed popularizing and making the game much more accessible. And recorded play and streaming are just going bananas. Uh, it's a time of feast. So we've named the established stalwart of the genre. Let's talk about the indie side of tabletop role playing. These are games that are primarily focused on the narrative experience of the players, rather than overcoming strategic or tactical challenges. That's different from Dungeons and Dragons, where most mechanics revolve around combat, and the job of weaving a narrative around them is typically done outside of the core system of the game. Alternatively, indie RPGs often lean into this fiction. So generally, they're not about winning or losing, though of course, Every rule has exceptions. Um, in a challenged base game like D&D, there kind of needs to be a loss condition so that the challenges that form the focus of play are meaningful. But in most indie RPGs, standing up and failing a challenge might be just as impactful in a character's narrative arc as success would be, and therefore can be just as satisfying. So for story games, the mantra is often play to find out. Rather than aiming to win with a capital W, you're here to find out how the story naturally evolves according to all of the tinder that we've brought and lit together as people at the table. So counterintuitively, um, even though they're called role-playing games, um, embodying a character, totally not necessary as a defining component. Um, many folks prefer the term story games. There may be no characters explicitly defined. We may share control of a single character. These games contain multitudes. So I've said that the mechanics should drive a narrative experience in a story game, that the fiction should come first. So let's ground this in an example. Here is a slice of the rule set from Apocalypse World, a fantastic game about life in the post-apocalypse by Vincent and McGay Baker. It is also one of the most widely known indie RPGs today. So in Apocalypse World, the MC, Master of Ceremonies, kind of an analog of the game Master, is encouraged to do as little prep as possible before the game starts, and then develop the narrative collaboratively with the players. In this example, this move is triggered when a character attempts to read a charged situation, and the answers to the question all help drive the narrative forward. So the reason that this is different than something like rolling a perception check, say, in a more traditional RPG is that the MC probably hasn't started the game with any answers to any of these questions and will be establishing new fiction in response to the question. So through the question and answer, a significant new piece of the narrative is born. Ultimately, it's the system that adds to the narrative. The player has established how things became charged, and then the MC responded to the move by providing an immediate threat. Suddenly, we have a game. So full stop here uh, for some healthy warnings. Uh, when you recount trends in history, there's much that is dramatically incomplete, and that is also true of this telling. Um, all of this is offered to you as a taste in anticipation of future conversation and play. So, take this generously. Um, let's place our focus in the modern era for these games. Many of the tabletop RPGs that are most widely known, Dungeons and Dragons, Call of Cthulhu, Pathfinder, they actually have their roots in games that are decades old. So even though they've gone through dramatic iteration, significant dramatic iteration, the core focus of the game and what it tells the players to care about has been essentially untouched. So Traveler is a wonderful example of sort of more traditional design that has some really interesting ideas about mechanizing the story of a character through um, character creation, uh, through something called Life Paths. Um, and it probably goes down into history as one of the only well-known games where you, uh, you can die as a character as you create them. Interesting. Um, so as a focus of study, we'll talk um, about a more modern brand of RPG. So we'll root ourselves in the glorious 90s aughts and 10s that gave us games like Fiasco, where you relive a Coen Brothers-esque catastrophe during play, uh, Microscope, where you tell a story of fractal histories using nothing but index cards at the table, or The Quiet Year, a map-building game about community. <laughs> 
along with very many others. So story games are tremendously useful as case studies for narrative design for a number of reasons. For one, they're forced to wear their design choices on their sleeves because they need to be run by the players at the table. So if a GM is facilitating a game, it can really help if they have some unobstructed view of the designer's intentions. Then they can lean into them. That's why the books of these games are often very candid in the decisions gone into design and what their fundamental intent is. So design discussion also has been very public through a variety of well-trod online forums, one of which is sadly disappearing in a week. Goodbye, Google+. Um, they've traditionally been the projects of highly passionate folks who love really nothing more than getting into long-winded forum discussions or dissecting different types of narrative play. Um, and finally, they iterate super quickly. Take Apocalypse World, which was released in 2010, um, and has already spawned countless variant systems. Um, these games are said to be powered by the apocalypse. Uh, in the main online repository hosted on the Apocalypse World website, you can find hundreds uh, of powered by the apocalypse games, many of them bending the established systems and taking them in completely novel and uh, fascinating ways. So let's highlight some ideas that we can consider from modern indie role-playing games. I'll introduce a concept that's been explored in recent story games and offer you a question that this concept raises for narrative design as a whole. Let's start with a topic in modern story game design that's everywhere and that everyone has an opinion about, and that is the role of the GM, the person who has traditionally shepherded the entire narrative experience. So historically, tabletop RPGs viewed the game master as an ultimate authority. Uh, it's not unusual to hear them use terms like my game and my players with a sense of ownership. Uh, they were in charge of making play, world building, and honestly, really the vast majority of the experience at the table. While the players controlled their individual characters, the GM gets to build worlds, write histories, place props and objects when narratively convenient. Uh, they had special authority within the mechanics of the game and then were generally the source of antagonism, conflict, and plot for everybody. So in many ways, the GM role, as separate and apart, has been nurtured by many components of the game systems themselves. GMs have different books, um, full of different content, even though they operated with the same basic system rules as players. They had scripted module players. Um, they had scripted modules that players weren't allowed to look at. Um, and they even had a physical barrier between them and the rest of the table. When you think about tabletop RPGs, this is probably the image that springs to mind. But story games have been blowing this assumption wide, wide open for a long time. Let's talk about that. So let's take Fiasco as an example. This game is all about setting players as characters in a complicated, interwoven caper where everything goes to shit very quickly. The tagline is ordinary people with powerful ambition and very poor impulse control. This is a fantastic game. Um, the game begins by setting up relationships between characters using cards um, in a, its newest iteration or dice in the classic form, um, along with other plot elements that will be part of the story. So glossing over the overall structure, but essentially in each turn, a player will set a scene with some subset of the other players at the table to develop on some thorny situation that they were originally put in. Maybe they need someone beaten up. Um, maybe their cousin is a bookie and they can help them out. You, you get it. Um, as the scene reaches a climactic point, the players at the table not in the scene determine if things go well or if indeed they go very poorly uh, for the active players. The active players will then use that prompt to resolve the tension of the scene. So from the example of Fiasco, um, I think that we can see that 
there actually wasn't a whole lot about the narrative authority being vested in a single party that was fundamental to the form. In Fiasco, the role of the GM is spread dynamically among everyone at the table. Depending on how you look at it, you might say that this means that there are either no GMs, leading to the term GMless, or perhaps that everyone is a GM in this, in this case, giving us the term GM full, uh, and the paradox being that both of these terms end up meaning very similar things. Um, so with Fiasco, this distribution of narrative authority is done mechanically. But uh, this is by no means the only way of splitting narrative authority and how it can be handled. So another great example of this is the game 1001 Nights um, by McGay Baker, um, where players each improvise tales in the style of Scheherazade's 1001 Arabian Nights. So here, gameplay is split between the present day, you are members of an Arabian court, going about your daily lives and its intrigues, uh, and the various stories that you use to that you use to connect with others. So when telling a story, usually to expand on a juicy point that came up in court, the players will start to improvise in the style of A Thousand and One Nights. And when they need to introduce a totally new character for their story, they'll recruit another court character um, to play the role. Then this recruited player has narrative authority over that part of the story. So in A Thousand and One Nights, narrative control flows from the fiction itself, rather than being heavily mechanized, which is a nice distinction between it and fiasco. Another way in which games have sought to do away with the role of GM has been to carve it up and distribute discrete chunks of it to players explicitly. So two games that split narrative authority in this way are Downfall and Archipelago. Downfall, by Caroline Hobbs, um, tells a story about the fall of a culture that we create during the game that ends up succumbing to its fatal flaws. It does this by splitting authority over players who control the roles of the hero, the pillar, and the fallen, who then each push and pull each other by representing different elements of the society. So in a scene, in each scene, the, the hero tries to save the world, naturally. The fallen tries to corrupt it, and the pillar, an average person, tries to stifle change, maintain status quo. Every two scenes, roles rotate, and that allows each player to embody all of the roles over the course of the game. Each role also comes with certain mechanical responsibilities like framing scenes, which again effectively carve up the GM's traditional role. Archipelago is another great example that experiments with narrative control through a few different mechanics. Important narrative license and um, environmental themes are divided among the players themselves. So for example, if we're playing a game in a sailing boat traversing the Pacific, one player may control the element of the weather or the ship. Um, and whenever uncertainty is raised about that element, um, you will have authority over what happens. Um, it also intersperses that with moments of narrative surprise by employing these really neat things called ritual phrases that players can use to prompt one another to change things. So for example, you can use a card like, that might not be quite so easy, to signal that you want to ramp up an answer and go another way. So all of this stems from sort of a core principle that's prevalent in the story gaming design language that's called the SEGA principle. It states that when one person is the author of both the character's adversity and its re resolution, play is not fun. So all of these examples give us ways to distribute that work between players to make sure that even when narrative authority is split, there isn't a player just stuck in a loop answering their own questions. So finally, um, we can ask ourselves, with all of these games distributing narrative control in interesting ways, where does that necessarily lie within your medium, with my medium? Who provides adversity, and what does that come from, or where does that come from in a game? If your default is to consider that it should come from the system the players are engaging with, maybe it's time to challenge that. You may be able to introduce more distribution and narrative authority than you think, 
Uh, and in doing so, you can give players much more agency over the things that they want to explore. So who has control of what goes past? Just who unfolds the next narrative beat, but also fundamentally what topics someone wants to engage with. Um, and it really ensures uh, that players can investigate the themes that they enthusiastically want to. These choices inform the themes that ultimately define the narrative um, so that it's not tied to the fiat of one single creative authority. So I offer you this question. Who is in charge here? Another concept that I'd like to offer is something called the fruitful void, which has really helped me structure thoughts uh, around narratives in the past. Uh, it has its origins from uh, some of the community discussion boards in the 90s and has since become entrenched in the design language across the whole discipline. Dogs in the Vineyard, I'm giving you lots of good recs today, um, is a game by Vincent Baker based on a West that never quite was. Um, it's a GM's game and players are God's watchdogs or just dogs. Um, and as part of their duties, they travel from city to city, delivering the mail, helping out with community functions, and also, of course, enforcing judgments of the true faith of the king of life, as you do. Um, so Vincent Baker once published this image on his blog, and all of the arrows are mechanics in the game. You don't need to know what they represent specifically in the game, but just to know that he stated that what was in the whirlwind itself was what the game was actually about what those mechanics are pointing towards. This concept of the real meat in your game being about what isn't mechanized has been formalized many times. So for example, My Life with Master, this is a game about role-playing as minions of this powerful master or mistress. Uh, it mechanized stats like wariness and self-loathing but it never talks about defiance, even though that's what all the mechanics in the game are hurling at the player to think about. So similarly, uh, part of Emily Kerbasa's romance trilogy, Breaking the Ice, is a great, great game for two people who play characters over the course of three dates, hopefully to find love. And the game mechanizes things like attraction and compatibility, but as Emily says right here, um, thinking about mechanizing the moment of falling in love is just silly. So she described the fruitful void of that game as being love and vulnerability. So when designing the mechanics around the emotional impact and narrative arc that you want the players to have, consider what it is and isn't, um, and what is explicitly mechanized. So what's nailed down and what are the mechanics swirling around and throwing into question? If you have an explicit system that measures the morality, say, of the player's actions, how would that change the player's reaction to it? Uh, and if your system really is about morality, how can you add force behind those pinwheels causing it to twist and turn? Now, I offer you a final concept. Artifacts of play. So these are side products of play that exist in the physical world, the one that we occupy as humans. Um, these can really help increase the emotional resonance of a narrative that the players experience in game by bridging the physical world that they live in and then the imaginary one that they occupy in play. So these artifacts live past the game. Uh, familiar cases of this in the digital context may be stuff like automatically generated tweets based on cute words that are used in word games um, that are funny even if you're not actively playing the game or some of the pictures that you could take uh, and keep in Firewatch. So story games have been experimenting with these for a while and they can pack a good punch. One example is from The Quiet Year by Avery Alder. So Avery Alder's game about telling the story of a single quiet year experienced by a community before the jackals return. So every turn, the active player turns over a card, which then asks them to answer one of two questions about what is happening to the community. They then get to take an action of their choice to help address the challenges that the community is facing. Uh, 
So a completely brilliant part about this game is how these changes are all reflected on a map that the players are collaboratively drawing and creating during play. So you create the map. It's a game of cartography and storytelling. Um, this map exists in the physical space uh, and uh, that both the, that the players occupy as human beings so that you can touch it, you can fold it, doodle on it, interact with it. But having this physical artifact really bridges the worlds, the one within the narrative um, and the one that the players live in as humans. It becomes also a living record of this particular instance of the game. For a second example, um, I offer one of our games to reinforce that um, artifacts don't necessarily have to be physical. So in dialect, players tell the story of an isolated community by building their language over the course of play. I will explain. Uh, in every turn of dialect, players add to the story of the isolation while simultaneously modifying the language. So in each turn, players define new words for their community and start using them as they role play members of the isolation. That means that they gain fluency in their own dialect as the game progresses. So things happen to the community, language shifts, and becomes more layered to reflect it. Um, and so in doing so, players discover the essence of these people that they're creating together, and the dialect they make becomes a language map, say, of what has happened to them. The language that you create in dialect is definitely an artifact of play. Um, but why does this enhance the narrative experience the game tells about the language itself? So every game centers upon the entire life cycle of the language. It starts from its birth all the way to its eventual demise. Um, the story experienced in the narrative is actually paralleled by the experience that the players have at the table. So the language that they're speaking together is born as the language of the isolation. Um, but when the isolation's language is lost, or you stop playing this game, the players find themselves also as the sole speakers of this dialect that they just created. So they too will go through this process. It's by blurring the line between what is real and what exists in the game, in this case the language, that we can mirror an experience the characters have, the death of their language, with one the players experience abruptly losing their language that they've been speaking in for the last three hours. That is a powerful connection to be left with. So I ask, what can you build during play that lasts beyond the game? Consider whether or not the experience that your players have as characters can be mirrored as a real experience that your players have as humans. Can you share elements between the two? And if so, you may find that the narrative hits home and packs a punch at a deeper and much more genuine level. Our time here is short. Um, and so I leave you with these concepts and questions, a small slice of the ground that indie RPGs are breaking. There's lots that narrative design across all mediums can learn from this incredible game space in order to tell deeper and more resonating stories. The only thing left to do is to go out there and play them. Do it. <laughs> Thanks a bunch. <laughs>
put the Game Master out of player's position. I certainly would hope so. Um, and I would challenge everyone here to think about that, because I think that there are big returns for doing so. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, I, wa I wanted to know how you feel about emergent narratives and games that uh, promote them, simulate them. Games like what? I'm sorry. Uh, that that uh, allow these emergent narratives to, uh, to blossom. Um, I am enthusiastic about them, okay. <laughs> as you can imagine. Any favorites uh, you have? Huh? I'm sorry? Any favorites that you have? Oh, it's so hard to choose. Okay. Um, but uh, at least in the world that I live in, in tabletop RPG, uh, they're everywhere. Emergent narratives are the name of the game. So, okay. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. I think we are officially at time. I'm happy to answer questions outside. Um, thank you so much for coming.